think sometimes um, we kind of div divide our emotions from our mind. And in some Christian traditions, there's more of an emotional bent. In other Christian traditions, there's more of a towards the mind bent. I think the places or the, the best place for us to be is when our mind and our emotions or our affections are integrated. Not that we just know the things of Scripture, which is important to know the things of Scripture, but be connected to them emotionally, personally, that we not just know things, but we feel things. Now, granted, some days we just drag ourselves in here, and I know you are coming, and we're all coming with something, right? Something that you're working through, or something perhaps that you're rejoicing in, or something that's troubling you. I understand that. I'm the same. And yet we have opportunity to focus <laughs> with our brothers and sisters on what matters most. At times, we're just saying the words. But my hope is that it would be more than just saying words, right? The words are true. The scripture is alive. But it would engage our mind and engage our heart, right? Beyond knowing, and we're going to go to a familiar passage today, that most, if not all of us, are aware of, of Jesus on the cross. The prayer is that we would gain a better understanding of not just what happened, but what happened through these events. And that it would reach our heart and that we would feel things as well. So perhaps some of you are on one side of the spectrum where emotions is where you live all the time. I would encourage you to move more towards the center and engage your mind. Some of us in this room are more cerebral, right? You're about in your head all the time. I want to encourage you to shift down a little bit and to connect to the emotions that you have. God, by the way, does think. God, by the way, does have emotions. And we are made in his image so that we have both of these things and God expresses both and God help us to express both in particular in what matters most so today we are going back to John 19 if you have a bible go ahead and open it up we're going to pick up the account starting in verse 16 and we're picking it up right after Jesus had been Betrayed, right? If you've been here with us, abandoned, flogged, brutally beaten, mocked, crown of thorns on his head, and rejected by friends, and rejected by leaders, and rejected by the people that he came to save. He was a bloody, physically bloodied mess. And emotionally, mentally beaten as well. This is where we then pick up the story. And the first main thing I would like us to focus in on and understand that Jesus bore the sins of many. We're going to get to that point, but this is the first thing I want us to understand. Again, John 19, starting with verse 16. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two others. One on each side and Jesus in the middle. By the way, crucifixion is a horrific way to die. It was intentionally set up that way as a spectacle and as a deterrent. Now, there are several ways in which someone could 
be held accountable for their trespass, stoning or beheading or various things. But this was different. It was set up to display and to cause the maximum amount of pain for as long as they can, so to speak. So here then was Jesus, now after being beaten and mocked and abandoned and abused in all of these ways, they forced this man to take up the cross. Now historians tell us, and often we think Jesus with a cross with a big beam down, down there, that's not really as they think how it happened. They are to carry the cross beam, the one in which they were nailed to, carry that. And that was a significant piece of wood. It wasn't just a little stick. It was a heavy, heavy beam, around perhaps 100 pounds. And so here is Jesus now, um, filleted in many ways, as we talked about last week, forced then to carry this beam throughout the city. There was a route on the kind of the main street and people would view this. And what would happen is that the charges for the person who was being crucified would be paraded with a plaque in front. So that when he walked down, and this was like close to people, right? It wasn't like, you know, far away in a stadium. People lined the streets. He would walk through and they would observe what would happen to someone who committed that crime. In this case, on that plaque was the words, the king of the Jews, in three languages. So all of those in this city would be able to read this. And so Jesus stumbled through the city. And another gospel talks about he was not even capable of carrying this thing, and they had to enlist another person to help him. And after being parade, paraded around the city in this bloodied state, go out one of the main gates of the city, close by the road, so that people then coming into the city would see what happens to criminals in that city. Jesus was mm, labeled as a criminal. So they took the one who was going to be crucified, laid them down first on this beam, stretched out the arms. Okay. And uh, a nail was put into each hand. And the nail, more than likely, was something around like this. Okay. These are like spikes. And they were driven, and what historians tell us, more than likely, they call this whole section part of the hand, if you can see this. We think, well, it's going to be here. Really, what they're saying is probably in here. And the reason being is that um, we have two bones right here, right? And so this would be stuck in there between these two bones. So it could withstand the weight. If you put it in here, you know, this, this is going to be pretty graphic, but this, this is the deal. Okay. Um, you could rip out. So they say, and it probably went right in here. By the way, in that little spot right there, there's a lot of nerves, blood vessels, things that are going right through there. And so they would put the person down for all to see. They'd take spikes, and it was four soldiers who were assigned to do this because it took four of them to host the hoist the person up. And they would drive them into his wrists. And so... The person there was this way, kind of bent up, and then the beams are in the ground, typically already the big uh, up and down beam. They're hoisted up, hanging. Could you imagine that? Hanging up to be displayed, affixed then on this other beam, and then the charges against the person would be labeled so that everyone walking by would be able to see. So you're hanging there, more than likely having your shoulders out of their joints, 
with all of the weight on the beam. And then they would take the feet of those being crucified, cross them over, and bend the knees. So they bent the knees on purpose, right? So cross the feet and then took a, took a nail similar to this drove it through both feet. And they found actually feet bones with nails driven in them from that era. This did happen. Right? Bent the knees, put your feet together, hanging. Often, if not always, during the heat of the day, completely exposed from head to toe. For maximum uh, effect. And as the hours went on, and sometimes people lasted on there for days, this is what happened. Your arms would, gravity is your enemy right now, right? Pulling you down, right? And so then the lungs would start to fill up, and I couldn't, I can't even get my shoulders up that high, right? And then in order to get a breath, you have to push up to grab a breath. And remember, the backs of these individuals had been ripped apart. And they didn't sand down the beam to make it feel real nice and cozy. Rugged. So you are dragging your body against the beam, as long as you can handle it to try to get some breaths, and you'd have to fight gravity. And down. For hours, as people observed you, as, in Jesus' case, mocked you until you got to the point in which either a they broke your legs because if your legs are broke you can't push up anymore and you'll suffocate that's how you die on the cross by the way or you just can't do anything anymore which was in Jesus's case This was horrific. Hundreds of years before the Romans were in power, and these practices actually happened as they did, God, by His Spirit, spoke to one named Isaiah, who, again, hundreds of years talked about this event. And not only did he talk about what would happen, but what happened through this event. So I'm going to read this prophecy. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Typically, we focus in on this on Good Friday, in which we will again preparing us all for Good Friday and Easter a little early. But it's good for us to think about this. This is Isaiah chapter 52, starting with verse 13. And I'm going to read it. I want you to picture this in your mind and then overlay it with what indeed happened to Christ hundreds and hundreds of years later. Isaiah writes, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. And his form marred beyond human likeness. So he, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. 
Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Now surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. Now we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his day. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is a moving passage. It's an astounding passage passage that is very specific to this event of the Messiah. Some think it's so specific they thought, well, someone must have inserted this passage into Isaiah's scroll to make it sound like it was Jesus, right? There's disputes about this. Truth is that this scroll, this writings were found intact, written at the same time hundreds of years before Christ. So there's no way that Isaiah or anyone would just write that in. It happened, it was predicted, it was prophesied. Down to the nails, down to the transgressors next to him, down to being put in a tomb of a rich man, and many other things. It describes the details of what happened, but not only does it describe what happened, but why it happened, right? Why it happened. I don't want you to be fixated on what happened, but understand the reason for it happening. On the cross is where the justice and perfection of God was met by the love and mercy of God. This is where it intersected. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the perfect one, the one who had no sin in him. Now you and I, we all have sin in us, right? Is there anyone here who has not committed a sin? 
We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the distance between God and us and us being transgressors, that's mean trespassers or someone who committed crimes, their moral crimes against the holy God, thinking that our way is better than God's way. That's, in essence, what sin is, by the way, right? We think that our idea of what should happen is better than God's idea. God, I, tell, I know you say, do not lie, but mm, no, I think it's a good idea right this time. God, I know you say that I should have no other gods before you, but mm, right now, it's easier for me to grab onto money or grab onto power or grab onto some pleasure that I know is out of bounds than to serve you, and on and on. God being just has to, must, because He's righteous, hold those guilty to account. And the wages of sin is what? Death. That's why even in the garden, if you read in Genesis, that in order to cover their nakedness in front of God, God did what? He killed an animal, by the way. Death was required, and this is the foreshadow even of the cross, to cover us. We see this story all throughout Scripture as you read and you walk with the people of God and how they continue to deny Him and sometimes follow Him and sometimes serve Him and sometimes serve themselves back and forth. So similar, unfortunately, to our life and they needed to have atonement that is a covering for their trespass as we do and they sacrificed us the sacrificial system why that was set up for tasting Christ and Jesus in steps into history at the right time as the sacrificial lamb, the final one. Not sin in him, but sin was put on him. And we believe in him. He pays our price. We receive peace. Not the, just the peace of God, but the peace with God. It's the gospel. So what was happening on this cross? He was bearing the sin of many, all who believe on him and in his name. And this was God's will, God's goodness. Jesus is the only one who could fulfill this role because he was innocent. Remember that the intention and the aim of the Gospel of John is to identify who this person Jesus is. Remember this? Right? That John writing these things through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote down events, wrote down teaching, wrote down surrounding um, interaction with Christ to point and to point to a point through Scripture to point to who this man was, that he indeed is the Christ, the Son of God. Right? And so this is why, of course, all Gospels include this in it, so we would understand the goodness of God, taking on him what was deserved us. I want you to let that sink into yourself personally today. Not just theoretically, yeah, Jesus died for me. No, <laughs> I want you to feel the weight of this. What was due us and his great love for us. Now, as we continue to read this account, we see Jesus is the king of the Jews. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. So here is Jesus hanging on the cross, two others, one on each side, him in the middle as a common criminal. Verse 19 of John 19. 
Pilate then had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this sign. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate. Don't write the king of the Jews. But that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Now Pilate answered, "Mm, what I've written, I have written. The sign may have looked like something like this, something like that, in the various languages of those who were gathered. And again, the crime was there displayed. And so Pilate understood that this was the king of the Jews, and it was kind of in a mocking way, right? That those who would read this would see the Romans were on top of the Jews. And even the king of the Jews was no match for the might of the Roman Empire. So don't you think that you're going to rise to the level of us Romans. It was a smack in the face to the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, to the, uh, the rulers of the Jewish people, and to all of the people. This is your king and we crucify dogs like you. This is why the Pharisees were offended by this. Don't say that he's the king of the Jews. Say that he claimed he was the king of the Jews. We don't acknowledge his kingship. And Pilate, under the sovereignty of God, said, what I've written, I've written. Pilate was prophesying the truth that Jesus indeed, of course, is the king of the Jews. Now, Paul the Apostle expands this out. So we say, well, the king of the DNA ethnic Jewish people? No, it's way beyond that. He's not just the king of the Jews, but he's king of the nations. He's king of everyone who becomes a follower or becomes a quote-unquote Jew by believing Paul tells us in Romans, and if you haven't read Romans for a while, read the book. Have we talked about reading the book before in here? Right? Read it. Right? Paul masterfully, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about these things. And in Romans chapter 2, says this, explaining who actually is a Jew. It says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, Right? Physically, nor is circumcision outward, that's a sign of the covenant, and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart being born again. By the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God, what God has done. So spiritually saying, even though if you're not ethnically Jewish, okay, The explanation is that we are grafted in, Scripture says, that we become a child of God, a covenant person connected to God's family because God has changed our heart, given us a heart of flesh for a heart of stone, spiritually speaking. And so this king, who is indeed the king of the Jews, if you're a believer, he is your king as well. God's power and His grace, meaning God's perfection and His justice. God gave to us what He requires of us through Christ. This, my friends, is good news. So this declaration that was above His head was true. Now, John also points out another thing about Christ and that Jesus' death fulfilled Scripture. He's been pointing it out time and time and time again, and he pauses to shift the scene on what was happening around the cross. This is verse 23 of John chapter 19. Now, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. Now, this garment was seamless. Woven in one piece from top to bottom. They said, let's not tear it to one another. 
Let's decide by lot. That is, rolling dice, who would get it? This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. It is astounding to me that um, theologians tell us that around 300 or so scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, was fulfilled in the life of Christ. 300, right? Can any of you predict what's going to happen next Tuesday with any detail? If you did that, you'd be considered a prophet. 300 in one person? There's no way. But there is a way. Because God did this. And one of these, he pointed out here, right? You say, well, Jesus knew, and perhaps intentionally, he did the things that were in Scripture to fulfill them. And there are a few instances of that. But this is completely different from that. These are four men who were selected on duty that day, right? Who were Romans who did not have any idea more than likely, of Scripture, nor of this passage, nor did they care, right? All four of them decided, not connected to Scripture, but under the sovereign eye and sovereignty of God, unbeknownst to them, fulfilled Scripture, which pointed to who that man was. John says, pay attention to this. And so, if you ever doubt Scripture, not just what was proclaimed and fulfilled in Christ, but yet what is proclaimed and is yet to be fulfilled through Christ, these things help your faith to understand Scripture is no joke. (laughs) It's not some man's idea like, hmm, we should start some type of religion. What should we do? Let's get together. It didn't happen that way at all. These things should help us to have evidence, reasons, rationale for our belief. This is one of them. Prophecy, prediction that was fulfilled time and time and hundreds of time again. Margie read the passage, Psalm 22. I'm not going to read it for us again, but specifically talked about these things. Now lastly in this account, John records this event. I intentionally worded it this way, Jesus cares for his own. It's an incredible picture, and we're going to read it here. This is John 19, starting with verse 25. So as all of these things had happened, and all of his possessions were gambled away, or given away, or taken away, that's a better way to put it, this took place, verse 25, near the cross of Jesus, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When this was written, people could identify these people. So John was just not writing on his own memory. They could say, hey, go talk to these people. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, which, by the way, was John, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. I don't know about you, but when I'm in pain, all I can think about is not being in pain anymore. I've never had a nails, I've never had any of this, you know, nails pierce me like this. I've stepped on a nail a couple times. Just a little bit. Through my shoe. Everything stopped for me at this point. Stopped working. I stopped standing, 
I stopped having my shoes on. Nothing else mattered besides what was happening in my foot. Right. Now, could you imagine, and by the way, this is pla- uh, intentionally placed um, against what the soldiers were doing, right? So here's Jesus up there, and they're, they're looking to get what they can gain out of it. And here now is Jesus in this horrific condition, not just being consumed by his pain, but caring for his mom, thinking about other people, right? Put yourself in that position. Was that what you would be thinking about that time? Me? Probably not. That's incredible. Now, more than likely, Joseph was dead. Jesus was the oldest son. In that culture at that time, the responsibility to take care of the mother was passed to the oldest son. That's why often they got the biggest inheritance, because they had a responsibility to take care of mom. So Jesus had this responsibility and this care, and he knew he was going to die, right? Some people say, well, you know, if someone else put in, there's all these series, it's nonsense. He knew he was going to die, and he saw John there, and he saw his mom there, and then he passed on that responsibility to John, and John indeed took her into his home and provided for her in place of Christ. This is a beautiful moment. And it speaks so much about Christ. Not just that he cared for his mother, but he cares for all those who belong to him. Do you remember one time, remember when, when Jesus um, was teaching and the house was full and his mom and his brothers came to get him because they're thinking he was kind of, this Mark talks about this, kind of like losing it a little bit, right? And Jesus said, remember this? Well, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Was he having like, you know, a moment? He wasn't. He was making a point saying that my mother and my brothers, my family are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Which means that we become a part of Christ's family when we believe the word and look to follow after him. Which means that Jesus in his lowest point was able to take care of the needs of those he cared about. How much more can he take care of your needs now in his glorious state? Do you understand that? This is good news. And John says, don't lose sight of this. Don't lose sight of this king who was being crucified, what he was doing in contrast to those who were around him. This is our king who cares for his own. This is good news. So I don't know where every single one of you are with Christ. And just in a moment, we are going to observe communion in which we renew our faith and trust. But my hope is, after spending time in this passage, that you would love Christ more. You honor him greater, that you treasure him with more passion. That you'll understand the great love of God for you. Right? And understand He cares for you. He walks with you. He gives you and I promises that are going to be fulfilled. This, the Bible is not a made-up fairy book. It's a reflection of reality. What happened, how it happened, why it happened giving us opportunities to believe in the promises that are yet to come. And that's the hope we stand in. Peace with God already. And paradise with God forever. In the midst of difficulty and sorrow. 
So I'm going to pray for us, and Dan's going to come up and lead us in communion. Let's just pause. So God, we thank you for your goodness to us. The great and awesome love of God meeting the wrath of God against sin. God, may what has um, been talked about today, presented from your word, stick with us. God, I ask that you would help our affections to grow. That we would indeed know about what happened, but more importantly, understand why it happened. So Jesus, as we um, acknowledge and say we are part of your body and your blood, God, if there are people here who are just on the edge or maybe think they believe but are convinced that they would put their faith in you today, thank you for the wonderful cross. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.